words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today marks the fourth Sunday that the Revised Common Lectionary, which is used in this church and in congregations throughout the world, draws our attention to the book of Job. Over the past four weeks through carefully chosen excerpts, we have heard the story of this man, Job, beloved of God, a man who did everything right. Job was successful in business. He made wise and prudent choices and became wealthy. And he was a family man with children who he cherished and worried over and a wife to whom he was devoted. He was a trusted advisor in his community, both on financial matters and on social and personal matters. He was thoughtful. He was one of those people that if you came to him for advice, you knew that you would receive good counsel. And even though Job was successful and wealthy and had his family to think of, he still didn't forget about those people who were less fortunate. He gave money away whenever he was asked, and he was known to be generous, a true philanthropist in his community. And even with all of this, even though he was an important man with his family and his finances and his charitable work to think of, even so, Job was pious. He spent time in prayer each day, and he was a fixture in the local temple. Job was one of those people who somehow managed to do it all be good at everything all at once. He was an example, an inspiration. The scriptures describe him as blameless and righteous, a man who especially honored God. And then tragedies befell Job, one after the other, a raid, a fire, a house collapse, until his business was destroyed and his children buried. Deep in his grief, he contracted an illness that left him unable to move without pain, unable even to leave what remained of his property. He was left alone and destitute. From the depths of his despair, Job cries out to the Lord, 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 I have done everything right. I have been pious. I have been generous. I have been prudent in my business dealings. I have been faithful to my wife. I was devoted to my children. I've been as honest and as righteous as I knew how to be. Why is this happening to me? Perhaps you have been there, faced with a tragedy that came from nowhere, watching as suddenly your life begins to unravel, a diagnosis, a divorce, a death. As your world crumbles, you cry out, why is this happening? What did I do? What could I possibly have done to deserve this? While I was training for the ministry, I served at a, at a hospital as a chaplain. It's a pretty normal part of how we prepare to be ministers. And I was assigned to a unit where people were waking up after car accidents or strokes. They were waking up and they were discovering which parts of their bodies were no longer accessible to them, their arms or their legs. Some of them couldn't move at all. And these people, by and large, had lived good, full lives. 
Many of their rooms were full of flowers. They had relatives sleeping on the pull-out couches every night. They had cards wishing them well, communities rooting for them. And yet when I sat with these people, the number one question they asked was, what did I do? What did I do for this to happen to me? What did I do wrong? It was the number one thing that they wanted to know. We humans naturally look for patterns. We seek ex explanations and causality, craving the control and the order and the security it brings. We like to think that if we do the right thing, if we find the right equation of kindness to hard work, to prayer, to study, we will have success. If I eat healthy, I will be healthy. If I study hard, I will ace my exams. If I work diligently enough, I will be promoted. And if I pray hard enough or well enough or the right way, God will bless me. Good leads to good. Bad leads to bad cause and effect. But the reality is that sometimes all the good in the world leads to tragedy anyway. Sometimes we eat healthy and we stay overweight. Or we spend years chasing the healthiest lifestyle and we receive a debilitating diagnosis anyway. Sometimes it's genetics or just plain bad luck. I remember this summer I enrolled in intensive biblical Greek, watching my classmates as they left the library hours before me, and hearing as they left their talk about parties and hikes and gatherings that they were planning. There is one of those classmates here in this church this morning, my husband Jacob, and he can tell you that as everyone else left, I was still in my carol, going over and over and over my notes again and again. And then I remember watching as they sat in class next to me the next day, and they knew all the answers, and they aced their quizzes and exams, while I scraped by, barely receiving the marks I needed to keep my scholarship. And perhaps that is not a tragedy. But I think we have all been there in that situation where you are working as hard as you possibly can, and yet you are not seeing the results that you expected, the results perhaps that you feel that you deserve. Sometimes, even when you're doing all of the right things, bad things happen anyway. And so Job, sitting in his house, abandoned and in pain, like many of us, cries out in anger and in anguish. I did everything right. God, I'm doing all the things they, they recommended, all the things I was told. Why am I still sitting here in pain? What is wrong with me? What did I do? And amazingly, God appears. God appears to answer Job's cries. God arrives, the scriptures tell us, in a whirlwind. And in response to Job's lament, God gives Job a tour. God draws Job's attention first to the cosmos, to the stars and the sun and the pillars of the earth, the great vastness of creation. And then God moves to the creatures of the earth and gets quite specific. God marvels over the grazing patterns of mountain birds. Look at how they climb, God explains. And God is wondering if Job has ever considered how grass can grow in deserted mountains. 
and sustain the wild donkeys that live there? And how eagles sustain their young on carcasses, growing strong by eating abandoned remains? And next, God takes Job to visit terrifying mythological creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan, who can crush ships with their tails, and whose giant claws were the stuff of ancient Near Eastern legend. Take a look, God says in the text. Take a look at these monsters which I made, just as I made you. This is a prime example of my handiwork. And God revels in these creatures for line after poetic line, delighting in their lives and their bodies, rejoicing in their play. To Job's cries for patterns and explanations for his misfortune, God answers with a whirlwind of beautiful, mysterious, unexpected life, with the stars and the sun and the earth in its rotation, with goats who build lives at impossible angles, and wastelands that harbor vegetation, with birds who nurture life through death, and terrible monsters who play and rejoice in their stay bodies and their underground homes. What is going on? <laughs> like so much good news, so much true good news, the good news of the book of Job is hard news first. It is perhaps no, not so much good news as a reminder, a reminder that neither God nor the world are a computer that the project of life is not a matter of putting the right things in the right order, in the right places, until success and happiness appear. It is a reminder that sometimes good doesn't lead to good. Sometimes, despite all good, tragedy still strikes. And that is destabilizing and uncomfortable and humbling news. But it is news that we need to remember, news we need to hear. It is the news contained in the old adage, there, but for the grace of God, go on. It is the news contained by the sentence, I am sorry. I'm sorry you were attacked instead of what neighborhood were you in or what were you wearing. It is the news of, I'm sorry your mother got cancer, as opposed to, now is she a smoker? It is the news of, I am so sorry people came into your congregation and attacked those that you loved, as opposed to, why didn't you hire an armored guard? It is the news of here is five dollars instead of he wouldn't be out here begging if he wasn't going to use that on drugs. God comes and God invites Job, invites us out of our obsession with patterns and causality out of the constant trial of trying to put the right things in the right order, in the right places, in order to make the right life come out. And out of blaming ourselves and others when this doesn't work. God comes in a whirlwind and shows that God and life is more mysterious more divine than that, bigger than that, that good does not always lead to good, and that there is nothing we can do, no amount of anything that leaves us with any surefire, steadfast 
guarantees. And that no matter how successful or how inadequate we are feeling, God's love for us is constant. God rejoices over the mountain goats on the scraggly cliffs and sings over the stars. God notices grass that grows in abandoned wastelands and the eagles eating carcasses. God crows in pride over the monsters of the deep, marvels over the power of beasts that terrify us. And this joy and this love and this wonder, this is completely and blessedly not attached to any easily quantifiable reward. God takes Job to the most forlorn and forgotten places, and there God names beauty. God takes Job to the darkest, most terrifying creatures and loves them utterly, is amazed by them, rejoices over them. And here is the other news from the book of Job, the other good news we encounter in both of our texts this morning. Somehow, with no rhyme or reason, new life comes out of the darkest places. Mountain goats raise young on cliff faces. Sea monsters play in the deep. In high elevation, far away from where anything should be able to grow, grass appears. From an abandoned carcass, young birds find sustenance and the strength to fly. From the floor of his house, covered in boils and soaked in his tears, Job sends up his prayers. And his prayers help him to see beauty again. He reconnects with his community. The friends who left him come back, and they are reconciled. He creates a new family and sees grandchildren born, and their children, and their children, to the fourth generation. From the side of the road where he is sitting, calling out in his pain, and being told to be quiet by the crowd, Bartimaeus, Another man who had lost everything, his sight and his family, is heard and is seen and is healed. And these two men, Job and Bartimaeus, are being talked about around the world this morning. Job got a whirlwind tour from God, God himself, and Bartimaeus, beloved of his father, Bartimaeus, the one who Jesus saw and healed. This evening at our concert, we will be celebrating another new start. Another place where joy and hope and life came forth as we celebrate the end of World War I, a war that at the time, to those involved, felt endless, a conflict that seemed unstoppable. And yet, here we are, a hundred years later, celebrating that peace. We often, in faith and in life, want to make things into an equation. If you do good, you will get good. And of course, there is an element of causality to the universe. We can increase the likelihood of certain things by doing certain things. But we know, even if we don't particularly like it, that sometimes, despite all good, tragedy strikes. That people lose their sight, lose their children, get laid off, get sick, often for no reason that we can discern, and through no fault of their own. 
And the texts this morning don't deny this. They don't tell us why, and they certainly don't argue that God has a plan or everything happens for a reason. Instead, they remind us that no matter what, we are loved by God. That even in the darkest places, God is there. And that from the deepest darkness, from the worst tragedy, the most striking injustice, new life and hope and stories emerge. Praise be to God. And amen.